So today we are here to welcome Mr. Mike Leach, a Washington local, New York Times bestseller of Swing Your Sword, appeared on 60 Minutes, featured in New York Times, Sports Illustrated, ESPN Magazine, and USA Today. Of course, he is currently the Washington State University head coach since November of 2000. With him is also Buddy Levy, a uh, Northern Idaho native. He's an author of several books, including Conquistador, River of the Darkness, American Legend. He's been featured in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Washington Post, and several others, of which I will not go on and on about. Currently co-starring with um, Brad Metzler's Decoded. Today we're here to celebrate their fascinating new book, Geronimo, Leadership Strategies of an American Warrior which gives us an examination of the Apache Warriors' leadership, uh, leadership approach and the timeless strategies which led to, to success. Please welcome Mike Leach and Buddy Levy. So I really appreciate everybody coming out and, uh, and we're honored to have you and it's, uh, and it's good to be here behind uh, enemy lines in the world of purple and uh, uh, to talk about Geronimo and uh, and we've had, uh, so far, had a pretty good book tour. Uh, uh, went to Spokane, went to Lubbock, Texas, Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas, and back here. So uh, really excited about the book. Uh, and uh, Buddy, I mean, couldn't have done it without Buddy. Had a lot of fun working with Buddy on, uh, on uh, this book. And I think it was a great partnership. And we both uh, uh, learned quite a bit, uh, even beyond uh, Geronimo, I think. And um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, it was a thrill to work together on it. And the, and the thing that I like best about this book is, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, it's got all the practical, interesting stuff. You know, how Geronimo was able to accomplish all the things that uh, he was, you know, and, and uh, what uh, part of the, the, the Apaches made them the superior warriors that they were. And, uh, uh, and I think one of the most exciting things was in the course of it, we'd, uh, as we'd get questions, you know, as we'd go through the material, there'd be a question, here's another question, here's another question, here's another question. And so we tried to answer all those questions. And then, uh, and there's a bunch of uh, sidebars in this book uh, specifically designed to answer these questions. And, you know, occasionally there's uh, folks that say, well, you're not supposed to have sidebars, either leave it out or... Uh, put it in the back, so we uh, said screw that. We went and put it wherever we wanted to because because it's our book, not somebody else's. And so, uh, so that part worked out good. And uh, and uh, and uh, I'll give it over to Buddy for some comments. Hey, thanks uh, again for coming out. Um, just wanted to say a little bit about the the process. Um, some of you who followed uh, Mike, Mike Leach's career and, and have uh, watched him at press conferences and seen him talk know that there's a kind of um, circuitous nature to his uh, discourse and to his um, way of looking at the world. And that was really intriguing to be a part of. Um, we, and I've been asked a number of times, you know, because uh, we spent a lot of hours uh, and I would interview him and uh, we'd go over certain chapters and I would record Mike and people always ask me, well, you know, did you talk to him about football? And uh, to which I can only say that a couple times last season, I, I thought about telling him that he might need a, a new punter. Uh, <laughs> but I, I never really told him that. I figure that the football part of it is, uh, you know, leave, leave football to Mike and to the people that he works with on a daily basis and, and tried to stick with, um, you know, the narrative of Geronimo. And it was a great process. I've written a number of books. This was the first collaborative uh, participation that I've been in. And I, and I do have to say that this was truly a collaborative effort from the very beginning, from the proposal phase to the point where we were drafting. And um, working with him was just a, a great back and forth and a lot of inquiry and a lot of shared interest in not only Geronimo, but uh, history in general. And the other thing that people are a little surprised to find out uh, is that Going into this, uh, Mike actually knew a great deal more about Geronimo than I did because he was fascinated with him as a young child. And I came to Geronimo sort of later uh, as I studied Native American literature in, uh, at Idaho. Um, but that said, I, I, what we want to do is just uh, give a really brief reading uh, and then open it up to uh, questions from the audience because I know you guys want to 
get involved and ask us what's going on. But just a, a few pages each uh, from a couple parts of the book that I think might uh, get you rolling. And I don't know, maybe I'll hold. Should I hold it? Should I? <laughs> or I can talk really loud. <laughs> what do you think? I'll, I'll, I'll make it look nice. We'll do a little bull. <laughs> When I was a kid growing up in Wyoming, there were cowboys and Indians. I always wanted to be an Indian. We played to see which tribe was the toughest, which lasted the longest, which put up the most resistance. And because historically the last to surrender were the Apache, I viewed them as having the highest level of achievement. The Apache offered steady resistance and held out the longest. That, that started my interest. Geronimo was the best of them. He possessed a kind of greatness. Greatness is well respected by everyone in all cultures. People just want to be able to see it and feel it and be in the presence of it, even if just for a short time. Geronimo pers personified a way of life, uh, personified a, 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 I'm sorry, Geronimo personified a life way of excellence and others around him rallied behind that excellence and followed him. It, uh, it's compelling. In his life, he was a living example of greatness and people, uh, even his adversaries could feel it. I admire his commitment to being the best. He possessed a great integrity and commitment because of the pro uh, his pride in being an Apache. He was committed to his religion. He had, a long, uh, he had for a long time an extremely high level of success, and whether rational or irrational, he felt this was his destiny like he was a man of destiny. He believed it was what he was put on earth to do and he pursued his convictions vigorously. He personified independence and assertive action. Geronimo and the Apache epitomized the American spirit. There is much for us to learn from the man and his people and insights to take away from his remarkable times. The Geronimo story taken as a whole is a tragedy. It's tragic that the Apache were not allowed to continue to live as they had for centuries, but things change, times change. In the end, the way the United States handled the Indians was not done in a fair and proper fashion, and the episode remains very much a black eye on this country. We weren't fair and true and right in the way we handled a proud people. It's tough to yank a people out of their time and setting. We took uh, traditional nomadic uh, hunter-gatherers and tried to turn them into sedentary farmers. Uh, how in the hell did we think this was going to turn out? The triumph in this story, however, is in the process rather than the final destination, and in the incredible feats that Geronimo and his people accomplished and how they pulled them off. I want to consider Geronimo's story and ask, what is greatness and how do we attain it? I hope you enjoyed the story, uh, the commentary, and the lessons. One thing uh, fascinates me about history is people uh, uh, it, 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 is, is, is how hard it is to pick. Uh, here we go. Uh, one thing that fascinates me about history is how hard it is to pin down. Example, the name Apache itself is unclear. It might be a Spanish pronunciation of the Zuni word Apache, which means enemy. I like that explanation because I like the idea of enemies and the Apache had their share. It's a fact the Apache traded with the Zuni, the Pueblo dwellers, the northern uh, New Mexico and, and raided them whenever they could. Now let's get something straight right out of the gate. The Apaches were raiders. Raiding means stealing, pillaging, taking from others what you want or need. The Greeks did it, the Vikings did it, the Huns did it, pirates did it. Let's face it, the American pioneers and settlers did it. They stole the Indians' land. I'm not saying raiding is right, but it's a historical tradition, and some people were expert raiders. The Apaches were expert raiders. In Apache, the word raiding meant literally to search out enemy property. It's another theory that the term Apache comes from the Ute name uh, for the tribe uh, uh, Awache, which means uh, people of the mountains. My favorite explanation is the word Apache comes from the Spanish verb uh, Apache, or uh, yeah, you can say it however you want. We, that, that's one of these words that you have the option to say however you feel like it. <laughs> um, to crush, referring to the Apache tendency to turn enemy captives 
over to the women and children of the tribe, who then pounded them to death with stones. It was not to get, uh, it was best not to get captured by Apaches. Uh, what we do know is that Apaches called themselves uh, Indi, which means, uh, meaning the people. Also spelled, uh, there's different spellings. Conventional wisdom, plus linguistic and DNA evidence suggests that they arrived via Canada and Alaska as early as the 13th century. The thing is, I'm not that conventional. There is other theories. I've never liked the theory that the Indians came over the Bering Strait land bridge. I have thought that that theory was absurd since I was a child. If that was such a good idea, why didn't the Europeans do it that way? Also, where are all the skeletons and artifacts that verify such a notion? In 1947, Norwegian researcher explorer Thor Heyerdahl sailed his handmade balsa wood raft Kontiki 5,000 miles over 101 days from South America to Polynesia. His journey showed that ancient South American mariners had the capability of sailing great distances which questioned accepted theories about the peopling of the Americas. Maybe the earliest Americans came from Asia by boat and landed in North America. Heyerdahl showed that the continent's inhabitants didn't necessarily come to North America via the Bering uh, Strait land bridge and uh, may have come from a variety of directions. Anyway, before contact with the Spaniards and their discovery of the horse, the Spaniards brought the horse back to North America after it had become extinct here, but that's another story. The Apache roamed on foot following buffalo herds using domesticated dogs to carry their belongings with packs, towing tra uh, travoy teepee poles wrapped in hides uh, to make a kind of trailer. The Spanish conquistador Coronado named the, the North, uh, came to North America in search of the seven cities of gold. It was probably the first uh, Anglo to see the people, Geronimo's ancestors, wandering New Mexico in 1541. He called them uh, uh, Coerchos, a name he learned from the Pueblo dwellers, uh, uh, originally the 12 Pueblos of eastern Rio Grande and central New Mex Mexico. Uh, Coronado said that the uh, uh, Correchos uh, were the most impressive physiques he had seen in the New World. They lived at the time off of buffalo, uh, making their uh, teepees with their hides, wearing their skins, sewing with thread from their sinew, making all's knives uh, from the bones. They, they made drinking jugs from the animal's bladders or intestines and relied on its blood as a uh, sustaining beverage. Coronado was fascinated by their technique he called uh, he, he said they clean the large intestine, fill it with blood, hang it around their necks to drink when they are thirsty, cutting open the belly of the animal. They squeeze out the chewed grass and drink uh, the juice. I like that kind of ingenuity and resourcefulness. <laughs> they survived on buffalo meat, eating it slightly roasted or raw. Depending on the situation, they dried the meat in the sun to make pemmican or jerky, uh, which made it highly portable. Uh, they were proud, fiercely independent, and dangerous. You did not want to fight them. But Coronado also said if you left them alone, they, uh, they were a gentle people. As we'll see with the arrival of the white man, uh, the people, the Apache, would become less gentle. And then one thing that <coughs> we provide in this book, okay, uh, well, we, we point out some lessons. Be curious about everything. Read everything you can. Uh, find, uh, yeah, yeah, read everything you can find out about your obsessions. And then the Mongols, the Mongol warlords, uh, basically, uh, well, we just thought it was interesting, so we put it in our book, but basically it's a recipe to make Mongol jerky. Uh, <laughs> I once heard that 13th century Mongol lords like Genghis Khan rode around with meat under the saddles to tenderize it before they ate it. And I wondered if that was true. I also wondered if the Apache did it too. Turns out that the Mongols and the Tartars actually did, in fact, put strips of raw meat beneath their saddles. The reason was to protect their horses' skins and also to heal their saddle sores. According to Cambridge Med Medieval History, 1924, after a day of riding with the meat under the saddle, the meat uh, would have been uh, downright edible, uh, downright inedible. 
uh, rank and soaked with horse hair, horse sweat. Despite the historical truth, the lore continues that steak tartare got its name from the Tartar people in Central Asia, when in fact the dish originated in France in the 20th century, named not for the Tartars who ate raw meat, but for the sauce Tartar served with it. And no, there is no evidence that Geronimo and his Apaches rode around with strips of meat under their saddles uh, or under their uh, butts when they were riding bareback. But they did carry their dried pemmican with them as they rode. Uh, uh, so you can see a little bit of the process. We sit, sit down to talk about Geronimo, and the next thing I know, we're, we're, he's talking about Thor Heyerdahl and uh, Mongol warlords and steak tartar. So, um, but it was, uh, that was the kind of thing that was really uh, interesting to, to go find out. You know, we, Mike would say, well, wait a minute. I, I'd heard that you know, the, how the Apaches, you know, how they carry their meat. And so we would, we would look into um, anthropology and find out how it happened. Um, just briefly, a, a quick reading um, on some of the uh, warrior training. Mike, you know, um, was also intrigued, of course, with the way the Apache warriors trained, and they began as young, very young warriors. So uh, we looked into this, and I'll just um, give a couple, just a little overview. Um, let me just see where we are on this. I don't want to go very long. Um, this is sections called um, pre-warrior training and apprenticeship. Um, Geronimo grew up on the middle fork of the Gila River near the famous uh, Tzagila cliff dwellings in southwestern New Mexico. Geronimo and his people camped there, protected by towering canyon walls. By now, the buffalo were all gone, and the Apache had become mountain people, tough and adaptable, able to thrive in mountains other humans found unlivable. In winter, they'd move to the lower valleys to hunt. Though nomadic, the Apache did tend small tracks of beans, corn, melons, and pumpkins, stashing their harvest in secret caves for the lean, harsh winters. Geronimo's family lived in clusters of dome-shaped brush houses called wickiups, roofed with yucca leaf strands. They also sometimes slept in taller, peak-shaped teepees like those used by the Plains Indians. From Geronimo's earliest memories, he was a warrior. He and the other boys played hide-and-seek among the rocks and cottonwoods along the river, pretending to be warriors. They practiced sneaking up on made-up enemies, rocks, or trees, and hid for many hours, utterly silent, practicing the stealth and patience they would need when they became warriors. This early practice would pay dividends later. Geronimo's entire boyhood was a long and rigorous apprenticeship in hunting, gathering, physical fitness, mental toughness, horsemanship, and warfare. To develop their deadly accuracy, the boys cut willow branches, then rolled little mud pellets in their hands and stuck them on the ends for spear points. These were whipped at birds on branches and rodents on the ground. They made slingshots from animal hide and sinew, and they shot bows and arrows from an early age, practicing hours on end for distance and accuracy. They were so into shooting their arrows that they sometimes stayed out all day, never stopping even to eat. Geronimo could shoot a bow and arrow with skill by age five. He learned to hunt from his father and elder warriors who taught him to crawl silently along the ground, snatching prey with his hands. To celebrate his first kill, he ate the animal's raw heart, showing it respect and gaining his adversary's strength. To stalk larger game like deer and antelope, he learned how to crawl along the ground for hours, wearing the hide, head, and antlers of a deer or antelope as a disguise. He studied his prey's habits, knew what they ate and where they grazed, knew their different tracks. He hunted rabbits, squirrels, turkeys, and grouse, too. Geronimo learned to build small fires at night to lure bats, then heave his moccasins at the creatures in flight with enough accuracy to knock them to the ground. Then he'd pounce on them and kill them with his bare hands. I really like the Apache technique for hunting ducks. It's innovative. In early winter, when ducks tend to flock in huge numbers on lakes, the Apache would take hundreds of gourds, dried and hollowed out pumpkins in big squash, and set them afloat on the lakes. The gourds would blow across the lake, and the Apache would go over and retrieve them, then repeat the process. At first, the gourds would startle the ducks, and they'd fly off. But over time, the ducks would get used to the gourds bobbing along the water and floating past. Once the ducks had learned not to fear the gourds, 
the Apache would take the gourds, cut holes for eyes, nose, and mouth, and they'd put them on their heads. Then they'd wade neck deep into the water with only their gourd head poking out above the surface. They'd sneak up on the ducks while imitating the bobbing gourd motion with their heads. When close enough, they'd drag the ducks underwater by their feet and stuff them in the bag. It was ingenious and highly effective. Um, one last little section. Um, warrior training was brutal. Geronimo had to wake up well before dawn and run up to the top of a mountain and back before sunrise. The goals were discipline, a strong mind, and legs and lungs so developed that no enemy could outrun the Apache warrior. These goals were realized. One elder put it this way to his young son. Your mind will be developed. Getting up early in the morning, running to the top of that hill and back will give you a strong mind, a strong heart, and a strong body. Running was an essential for the Apache way of life, and they worked at it endlessly. They were on foot more than on horseback because there were rarely enough horses to go around and because they could sneak up on enemies better on foot. As they trained, the runs got longer and more difficult. Sometimes they had to carry heavy packs on their backs and, to prove their endurance and mental tenacity, remain awake continuously for a day and a night or even longer without food. Part of this training included running many miles before daylight, then an icy morning plunge in a frozen stream in only their breech cloths, all before they were allowed to build a fire. One of the training tactics I found most interesting was this. Young boys had to run more than 10 miles up and down mountains, carrying water and rocks in their mouths, water or rocks in their mouths the entire time. They could spit out the rocks or water only at the end of the run. This proved their endurance and toughness. The exercise also taught them to breathe through their noses. If they failed, they had to do it again and again and again until they got it right. Geronimo did not fail. <coughs> Later, as a trainer, he would teach this skill to others. The Apache were tougher, much tougher than we are today. Apache warrior training was often a matter of life or death, and only the strongest survived. Besides running for miles and miles in the heat and cold, with a mouthful of water or rocks, apprentice warriors were encouraged to fight until they bled. Teams of four stood across from each other in rock slinging competitions. It was like playing dodgeball with stones. The object was to teach quickness and evasiveness. Boys had to duck and dodge to keep from being hit. There were casualties. If a rock hit you in the head, you were often severely injured or died. If one hit you in the arm, the bone often broke. Such training developed nimble, evasive warriors. <coughs> Rock slinging progressed to arrow shooting in the training regiment. The trainer placed teams of boys about 50 feet apart. On the trainer's command, they started shooting. The arrows were too small and light to be fatal, but sometimes they'd become embedded in their bodies. I like this quote from anthropologist Morris Oppler, who, believed, uh, who lived among the Apache and studied their life way and training. I'll, I tell you, they have fun, too, he says. They hardly ever hit each other. But I remember one boy who had been shot in the eye and had put his eye out. You have to admire and revere such training, commitment, and dedication, especially at such a young age. Even this early, training was life or death. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. All right, what do we do? I Questions? think we'll just open it up to audience questions about it, anything. If you guys can repeat the question. Oh, right. And uh, yeah, so if you uh, can say the question as loud as possible, and then we'll, we're going to repeat the question uh, as well so that everybody can hear it. So it sounds like he had, a lot of, had to lead a lot of people that possibly weren't very motivated. How, how do you as a leader motivate people that, don't, that aren't able to motivate themselves or aren't interested in that? I, Geronimo, uh, how do you lead people that, uh, that uh, aren't motivated? Um, I think the Apaches in general were pretty motivated because it was kind of a life or death thing. And that, and they took a lot of pride in their physical conditioning and their uh, adaptability in their environment. Uh, when it comes to football, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, one thing I uh, always try to keep in mind is you can't make anybody do anything they don't want to do. I can say, buddy, you have to do this or I'll shoot you. Well, I still can't make him do it. I can shoot him. I said that. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I can shoot him, but I still can't make him do it, you know. And so at some point, um, 
you know, you have to, in, in a, it, it, at times it requires uh, creativeness and sometimes it requires pressure and the best is peer pressure uh, if they feel like they're going to disappoint the group and so, so you need to get your team uh, in general motivated so that your weak links as far as motivation are going to follow because they don't want to upset their peers, they don't want to upset the guys around them, they don't want to upset the guys that they go play video games with and the rest. And um, But I, I think a lot of it is just selling and convincing this is what's best for you. This is what's going to uh, make you better and improve you and improve the team. And uh, and if you can't uh, effectively sell that, then really you, uh, you got three alternatives, you know. I mean, alternative number one is can you live with it? And, uh, and if, it, you know, if you can live with it, ignore it. Well, if you can't live with it, uh, uh, can you change it? And then if you can't change it, then you got to eliminate it. So then you cut them. But uh, uh, but that's somewhat goes into it for me. Coach, the, the, the story is really cool. It's really intriguing. Uh, the consequences of that culture were pretty drastic, right? So so how do we and, and how do you cross apply? Because you know, in modern culture, <coughs> in workplaces, a lot of protocols, a lot of rules. It's not designed for. You know, we're, we're in a culture now that's not really kill or be killed. We're, we're negotiating constantly and that kind of thing. How does it strike you to cross apply some of these lessons in, you know, in a culture like ours, where it's not cool to put the kid's eye out, for instance? You know? Can I ask the question again? Yeah, I, I guess the question uh, is, how do we apply the lessons of? Uh, Geronimo and his people today in different contexts. Yeah. Since the uh, consequences are were more dire then. Right. Um, you want to? Fire um, I think they want you, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's I, just get that out of the way uh, now. Well, I, I, I think that I think the the you know the thing that that I really liked about the Geronimo book uh, in in our research and stuff was like it was first of all. Uh, it, it, when, when things are dire consequences, when things, you know, uh, are, are truly tested, you know, like uh, in the Apaches case, life or death, survival, uh, and also uh, between Mexico and the U.S. Uh, efforts to exterminate them, um, I think that, that that's, that's when things are truly tested. I mean, that, that's, I mean, what's the ultimate test? Well, that's a pretty ultimate test. And, and, and I think that being the case, um, then, uh, because of uh, out of uh, the motivation, uh, the 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 innovation that uh, is required uh, to overcome such uh, obstacles and such odds, I think that's when uh, you see you know what are people really capable of. Well, I mean they're highly motivated for obvious reasons, but if they weren't that motivated, would we really discover you know how far they could travel in a day? What people really were capable of? So I do think. Being tested in that fashion illustrates a little bit about human potential, and then I think you can, uh, uh, you know, because everybody can work a little harder than they think they can. Everybody can achieve a little more than they think they can. Everybody's a little bit better than they think they are, and uh, and when you have opportunities to see uh, people tested in that type of fashion, I think it uh, it illustrates some of those potentials, and that's to me what really fascinated. Uh, me about the book is, I mean, there was one uh, item after the next, after the next, after the next, uh, where, you know, they could pre uh, prevail and have a high level of accomplishment. And that being the case, um, um, well, it, it, it illustrates that, uh, you know, we're all capable of a little more as well. Can you uh, go into uh, some sort of detail on the background of your research? Uh, the, the recent, whether, whether it was years and years ago or up till now, just kind of give us an overview of what went into your research and whatnot. Uh, details on the background of our research. Uh, well, in, in my case, uh, my research started uh, when uh, I was in when I was in about fourth grade, uh, and actually, actually prior to that, it was no. It was, let me think about this. Second or third grade, I lived in Golden, Colorado. Okay, so, uh, and how it started was, I discovered that uh, there are libraries. And I heard, hey, you could go to a library and they'll give you a book and you can walk out of there with it. So I went to my mom, I was stunned. 
I said, what's this? I mean, why haven't I heard about a library? I mean, square, there's books. I'd like to see some of the books. She says, yeah, you can go in there, check it out, and walk out with it. And so, so we go to the library, and her, me and my sister and my mom, and, and uh, I go, where's the Indian section? So we go to the Indian section. And then um, uh, she goes, you can get any book you want, and I'll read it to you. Well, and so I was going to make sure I got my money's worth on this thing. I got the biggest book on, uh, that I could find, and it was on Geronimo. And, uh, and she did, she would read us a chapter every night, have to specifically explain things. And so that's where my interest took off. And then I read all kinds of material on Geronimo, uh, um, you know, any, anything I could stumble across or see, and, uh, and then did that. And then, uh, and, and then, in, in our case, working with Buddy, I mean, obviously there are a lot of interesting sources and things like that that we had the opportunity to sift through the research and stuff like that, and and uh, you know we would discuss it, go over it together. Uh, how do we want this thing shaped? Is this important? Is this not important? And there there's quite a lot of material on Geronimo. Uh, at least in my case, uh, there was more than I thought there would be. I thought there'd be quite a bit, and there was more than I thought there'd be. And then. Uh, well, yeah. Let me. I'll, I'll just uh, on the research. Uh, just to follow up, um, I had written a couple of books about uh, Mesoamerica prior to this one, so I was versed in finding all of the source material that essentially is available um, on on a particular subject, and spending a good deal of time, you know, pouring over that, compiling uh, the, the central texts. Um, and so when we started working on, from the proposal phase, I think back in 2012, um, I began the process of compiling essentially everything that's ever been written about Geronimo and stacking and cocooning myself with this stuff. And then sifting through, uh, knowing that we were trying to write a cradle to grave biography of the man Geronimo with a leadership component to it and thinking about it that way. So there's some synthesis that goes on anytime you take a, a fairly big story um, and then try to condense uh, not I'm not suggesting the highlights because this is fairly comprehensive uh, cradle to grave biography but um, you still want to there's editing that goes into that and figuring out like what's the best what tells the best story that is still true to the character of Geronimo and, and I think to our um, shared interpretation of his character uh, so that was what pretty much um, my responsibility was, you know, sharing with Mike everything uh, that could be found on Geronimo. And, um, and I, I think uh, if you look at the bibliography, I think the book that he got as a second or third grader uh, is Angie Debo's Geronimo, which was uh, maybe until this, uh, the, um, you know, the go-to biography of Geronimo's time. Other questions? And how are we doing for time? You're good. good? Okay. You're good. Now, obviously, both of you... Uh, have a lot of respect for Geronimo uh, and his leadership abilities. Is there anybody today that you think or you have admiration for as far as a leader, and are there any um, uh, things that are similar between the two? <clears throat> uh, leaders uh, today that we have admiration for, uh, I think there's a lot. I, I think there's there's really uh, quite a few, and I think, uh, you know, you, you you run across, you 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 read a story, or you see something. I mean, maybe it inspires you uh, long term, and you study it more. Maybe it's uh, kind of a short term uh, uh, impressive item. Uh, and there's an awful lot of good stuff on nowadays. Anything from the ESPN 30 for 30s, or you know, you have uh, Football Life on the NFL Channel if you want to stay in the football thing. Uh, Growing up, the three coaches I looked at were uh, were Vince Lombardi, uh, Bear Bryant, and Billy Martin. Billy Martin was my favorite, and then um, and then I well, I had uh, uh, and then lately uh, uh, John Wooden. And I'm not a basketball guy. I mean, I I don't necessarily know the rules to basketball, and I did have the opportunity to go meet uh, Coach Wooden a couple years before he died um, in, uh, in the apartment in, in, in Encino, and it was full of Abraham Lincoln biographies. He was a big Abraham Lincoln guy and just a very smart, clear-minded individual. As a matter of fact, um, before we go to camp each season, 
I, uh, uh, and there's a specific one. There's been several books written about Coach Wooden. The one I read is, is it's called Wooden, and it's by Steve Jameson. It's kind of blue and gold. It's not a real long book. But what I like about it is it kind of organizes your thinking as you uh, uh, work with a, a group or a team to kind of achieve the same goal and just provides a little, it's kind of almost a recipe for mental clarity. And I've, uh, so I'll, I'll read it, and I'll read it again this year. I just uh, made it uh, required reading for our quarterbacks. And uh, so uh, I think there, the, you know, there's plenty around to, to draw from all over the place and yet constantly stumble on it too, so. Uh, just my quick answer to that as far as leaders uh, today um, that we can sort of connect to the Geronimo story. I guess the closest for me would be, in certain ways, the Navy SEALs, because a lot of uh, or people like special ops, special forces. Um, you know, Geronimo was often working with very small teams, uh, stealthy um, raiders, and he would, you know, come in at night, sneak in quietly, do what he had to do and get out, and it, it's it's a model. And I do have a great deal of, of reverence for you know our special forces who um, you know put themselves in harm's way in, in the most dangerous situations that exist, really. Uh, so you know that's they're not individuals, but it's sort of the way he operated um, as a as a team leader. Coach, you kind of have uh, I think your coaching style be described as aggressive and daring, maybe. Are there parallels between? Geronimo's state of mind, and maybe your coaching style? Uh, parallels between my coaching style and Geronimo's state of mind. I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I would like, you know, it'd be fun for me to pretend or think that there is. I, uh, uh, but I think uh, the, his, the stakes for him were a little higher. You know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, nobody's uh, nobody's getting killed out there playing football. So I think that uh, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, it'd be it'd be fun to think about it that way. But I also think, in a lot of ways, it'd be a little bit disrespectful to the efforts of Geronimo. But I also think I do think though, uh, there's uh, lessons and all kinds of things that can be drawn as far as uh, you know, motivating a group, getting a group of people to work together that uh, uh, are helpful really in anything you do. Yeah. Buddy, I see that you uh, are employed at Washington State University. Did you guys know each other before Mike came to the school as our coach? Um, the question is, did we know each other before Mike came to Washington State? Uh, and the answer is uh, peripherally. Well, I, I, I learned, I knew of him. Uh, as a lot of people did, and was very pleased to find out that Mike Leach was coming to coach our football team. But uh, we share uh, a, a literary agent and uh, who worked with Mike on Swing Your Sword, and uh, maybe you should tell him the story. It's a pretty good one. Uh, but so I found out about him, and then I, I uh, approached him. Well, it's the strangest coincidence there is, and I've said this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a big uh, it-was-meant-to-be guy. Uh, because typically that's a, an ex, a, a cop out for when things don't turn out the way you hope they had. You, you, you reduce it to well, it was meant to be, but maybe this was meant to be. And um, so uh, I'm in Key West. I'm busy as can be. I'm on Sirius Radio five days a week and uh, flying around doing book signings for Swing Your Sword. It's about four months before Washington State was open, uh, and then uh, Scott, we self-published Swing Your Sword. And uh, Scott was a consultant for us on it. Scott's the guy in New York. And Scott's worked with Buddy before on other books. So Scott told me about Buddy Levy. He says, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I had a picture of Geronimo behind my desk. I've, uh, over the years, I've told stories about uh, uh, Geronimo to my teams and referenced Geronimo in press conferences. And so, uh, and so Buddy, uh, Scott says, Buddy wants to do a book on Geronimo and would like to work with you uh, on a book about Geronimo. And so he goes, I think you guys would really hit it off, so you ought to talk. So uh, and Buddy had written a great book on Davy Crockett, which everybody needs to get that. He wrote a great book on the Conquistadors, and everybody needs to get that. And um, so uh, 
uh, anyway, so I read the Davy Crockett book, and then, um, and so when, and, and, and after Buddy and I talked, I thought, well, this is nice to think about, but I'm busy as can be. Uh, you know, these things tend to run out of steam, and uh, I'll probably never hear from this fellow again. And, uh, and, and all I knew was uh, that he was on the show History Decoded, and, uh, and was a professor somewhere up in the Northwest, maybe Idaho, and that's what Scott had said. And so then, <clears throat> four months later, I get the Washington State job. And, uh, and the, the busiest time is the, the first week or so. so. And it's the first week, and I'm busy as can be. And uh, well, the secretary says, there's a guy here, here to see a, a professor named Buddy Levy. And I'm thinking, Buddy Levy, Buddy Levy. Oh yeah, the, the Davy Crockett guy. Well, so then we meet Buddy Levy's a professor at Washington State. How about that? Uh, I mean, out of 120 some odd institutions that I could have ended up at, I ended up at the exact same college that Buddy Levy teaches at. And well, from there, the book really fell into place quite quickly. Uh, we'd go to Cafe Morrow uh, and have uh, multiple hour conversations, uh, uh, drink a lot of coffee and tea, and um, uh, and uh, well, and then I guess. Uh, Oh, there'd be phone calls that would last uh, as much as four or five hours. There would be uh, emails. Of course, you'd e we email stuff back and forth and write, rewrite, uh, cross out, adjust. And, and uh, so it was particularly intense uh, uh, late February through July, I'd say. Oh, just a quick answer to that. Um, did we know each other before? But. Um, you know, there's a lesson that Mike has in here that is everything is preparing you for something else. And I think that that applies here. Um, and as far as those uh, texts and conversations, he was very hands on. Uh, I told someone yesterday, they asked me if during the process of doing this book, if I had become friends with Mike Leach. And I said, well, um, yeah, we're friends. I think that he I've done more texting and corresponding with him since the book started than I have with my wife, uh, which is, you know, that's, that's either well, you be the judge. Uh, a couple more? Okay, then. Hey, thanks so much for coming out. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, great, uh, great to have you guys here. And uh, good to, there's more crimson in this store than there probably has been in here for a long time. And Jeff, go Cougs. Okay. Yep. Right <laughs> Mike Leach and Buddy Levy.